Good afternoon, Jay. How's it going? Good afternoon, Raj. I'm doing good. I'm gonna come back to Delhi in another two days' time. So excited about that. I've been and away from back for quite quite a while now. It's been twenty days almost. Twenty days, yes. And then you're yeah. back to Calcutta after a couple of days in Delhi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like the procedures are still left to be completed. Mm. So for for our viewers who don't know, Jay is about to become a father. How does that feel? It feels great, bro. I can't wait to play with the kid, like you know, throw him around, and uh, you know, take him to the water and dip him in for the holy dip. You know, that will be like a great experience for the kid. Like you know, it- all the mm-hmm. neurons would be uh, activated when you put put him in the cold Ganges water. Like, ooh, nice. Ah. <laughs> तू अपने बच्चे को गैंजेस में डिप करेगा yeah. तो हिंदी बोलता हुआ निकलेगा या बंगाली बोलता हुआ निकलेगा आई आई डोंट नो प्रोबली स्पीक संस्कृत ब्रो झटकम झटकम गो आई एम सॉरी इट्स अ जोक डोंट अरेस्ट मी चलो स्पीकिंग ऑफ फादर्स the government of india which is uh, in a way if india is a kinship group it is a father yeah it, it the is a fatherly figure yes it is busy with the organizing of the incoming lok sabha elections of 2024 yes. the biggest democratic exercise in the world yeah ekdam rat ke bola na tune jaise wo class 5th yeah. mein bacche इलेक्शंस पे ऐसे लिखकर क्लास के सामने रीड आउट डेमोक्रेटिक डेमोक्रेटिक तुम हो ना नहीं तुम ऑफ़ द एक्सरसाइज इन द वर्ल्ड आज का हमारा टॉपिक का डिस्कशन है इंडिया की इलेक्टोरल हिस्ट्री द मॉरल कोड ऑफ कॉन्डक्ट Yeah, I mean, I think it should also be more in English because I'm assuming there will be some viewers who do not understand Hindi. So, fair, fair. We yeah. must keep it inclusive of all yeah. linguistic groups. Coming that to yeah, we'll start with this. Coming back to yeah. our topic of discussion, uh, electoral history of India, Jay. Uh, hmm. I believe uh, we've done some research to put the content out there. Yeah. So, so uh, india is a very young democracy uh, we got independence from our colonial masters in 1947 and after that this experiment with western philosophy with respect to democracy was pretty nascent and we faced our fair share of problems specifically with respect to the autonomy and independence of the organization which conducts elections that is the election commission of india and it draws its power through constitutional uh, constitutional backing in the article 324 of the indian constitution now in order to understand how the electoral processes uh, have changed and evolved over the years there were multiple committee uh, committees that were established by the central government the first and the most important committee it was the tarkunde committee which was established in 1974 it was uh, formed on the basis of the citizens of democracy it was appointed by the revolutionary uh, socialist leader uh, of india called uh, jay prakash narayan for our younger viewers uh, he was a very big political figure uh, after the congress party back then and uh, the election uh, what this committee said was that the election commission uh, should not only be independent in theory but also manifestly uh, appear to be so in the exercise of its power while conducting elections it recommended that the members of the election commission uh, should be appointed uh, by the president on the advice uh, of a committee which should consist of the prime minister leader of the opposition or any member selected by the opposition in the lok sabha and the chief justice of india of the supreme court so the present rules that we see for the selection of the members of uh, the election commission of india the seeds of that rule and procedure were in the tarkunde committee so this is the very newly implemented selection panel for the selection of india's chief election commissioner and election commissioners yes so it's very similar to actually the process of appointment of the cbi director 
that you have the yeah. prime minister a leader of opposition and a, a chief justice of india or a supreme court judge so yes. that uh, that i suppose is the way to establish neutrality in institutions and uh, objectivity in their performance so let's yes, carry on the discussion yeah the other committee that was established after the arpinde committee with respect to electoral reforms was the dinesh goswami committee the dinesh goswami committee said that the appointment of the chief chief election commissioner uh, should be made by the president in cons- consultation with the cgi and the leader of opposition as we had discussed in the previous committee but it also went on to say that the cons- consultation should have a statutory backing now what statutory backing means is that the central government would pass an order or an act and that act would give this process of I mean recommendation yeah uh, it, it would get its sanction from an act of the par- parliament from an act. that's exactly. what a statutory act, body yeah, means, right? yes 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 and that act being the uh, representation of uh, people's act 1951 and uh, basically this committee also said that after the expiration of the office uh, of the chief election commissioner and other election commissioners they would be ineligible for other government appointments including becoming a becoming a governor like as we discussed uh, and as you had mentioned previously that uh, this is done to ensure that there is a non bias approach with respect to the conduction of the elections uh, in order to ensure that there are no other government posts allotted for the erstwhile election commissioners and the chief election commissioners uh, the com- committee is here ensuring that the uh, the biased or pro- unbiased approach is consistent because if if say you promise uh, lush postings in the government or or uh, the posting of a governor uh, say to the election commissioner then the incentives then they will lose impartiality exactly the impartiality aspect of it is is lost the constituent assembly and uh, the founding fathers of modern india in many yeah. ways uh, it can be interpreted to an extent that they expected a certain degree of impartiality and neutrality from all the constitutional bodies yeah simply meaning yeah. the bodies that derive their power from the constitution of india that could be the election commission etc yes so uh, the other uh, statutes that uh, were implemented other than the representation people's representation of people's uh, act uh, uh, the the other statute that was implemented so the uh, representation peoples of uh, uh, representation of people uh, people's act uh, 1951 was amended uh, in order to incorporate the recommendations of the dinesh goswami committee another uh, another act was passed which was called the uh, chief election commissioner and other election commissioner conditions of service act 1991 which also enshrined these recommendations so the amendment that was made in the representation of people's act was in section 159 and uh, it basically also uh, enabled uh, and also the, the recommendations also enabled uh, the election commission of india to deploy employees of public sector union or and other uh, psus uh, for election duties including uh, uh, including autonomous bodies which were totally funded by the government or partially funded by the government so uh, uh, say like organizations of like ongc would and the, the officers under ongc would also be employed uh, for uh, you know certain election duties and these were also recommended in the dinesh goswami committee right yeah so uh, that we have established the procedural electoral history of india yes uh, now we can uh, get down to speaking of uh, the present day the moral code of con- the model code of conduct forgive me and yeah. uh, how elections are organized funded so presently we are sitting today oh, it's the 20th 22nd of march and uh, yeah the model code of conduct has set in about f- uh, for the last week or so and yeah. uh, let's get down to speaking a little bit about its provisions its guidelines the election commission of india is a, it draws its power from the constitution mainly to regulate and conduct elections objectively in india and uh, 
its efforts are largely done by promoting transparency to improve law enforcement and uh, for that certain conduct has to be followed in the pre election period so yeah. these guidelines they'll include many things like uh, you know you will prohibit political adver advertisements that can cause certain kind of disharmony you know targeting of communities for example based on religion caste etc yeah. is this a blatant violation of the model code of conduct there will be a restriction on mainly the ruling party for using government machinery for electoral campaign related purposes and uh, there is going to be a uh, you know a, a prohibition on things like uh, canvassing or heavy polling near polling booths and uh, that though because you know that india has a history of booth capturing in the past and yes. uh, bullying by certain elements of, of voters into voting in a certain way or for, for a certain political party there was also a common practice of handing liquor to uh, the voters handing cash to the voters and this kind of spectrum of affairs which could manipulate electioneering in india has to be barred and as i mean result, honestly if you give me a bottle of jack daniels and some coke i would go and vote for the party that uh, you know that wants me to vote for it Yeah, coke, yeah by coke i mean coca cola jack and coke by coke i mean coca cola yeah th thank you do not clarifying. infer anything do not yeah. infer anything else <laughs> you may, yeah we'll refer to it as coca cola from now to avoid any yeah. confusion yes. and i mean if uh, if you <laughs> if you hand me hmm. a bottle and a, a live chicken that i can go home and cook and i'm a voter from any part of rural india as a normal person maybe my direction of voting could be influenced yes <laughs> you know I, <laughs> yeah and so i mean no 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 human being is free from influence and as a result these guidelines have to be strongly enforced yeah so jay let's get your thoughts on that um, so the model uh, so yeah, the model code of conduct can be divided into eight broad categories there is the general conduct there is the meetings procession polling day uh polling booth observers party in power and the guidelines okay. on election manifestos so these are the eight categories under which the model code of conduct can be uh, divided into and that's how the model code of conduct is actually released uh, by the election commission of india in its website in fact election commission of india was one of the first uh, first constitutional uh, organizations to have its own website in 1988 and it it released the model code of conduct back then itself and released other very important uh, very important uh, uh, data with respect to elections in different parts of the country so uh, this is also a very interesting piece of trivia another thing that people need to understand is that the model of code model code of conduct is not legally binding it does not have any statute uh, in fact uh, what the election commission of india does is that it uses its moral sanction to impose the mcc and on the basis of the moral sanction it is expected that most of the uh, government uh, most of the political parties would abide to it say there is a there is a uh, there is an alleged breach of the mcc what the election commission of india would do is that they would send them uh, a notice for breach for which they would expect a reply in writing where uh, the political party which is accused or a, a politician who's been accused of violating the mcc would uh, be required in the written reply would be required to accept his or her fault uh, would be expected to write a written apology if that violation is that alleged violation is proved or rebutting the allegation so uh, with respect to that uh, the eci would send in a written censure ECI de derives power from the article 324 of the Indian Constitution and can sometimes uh, conduct a uh, uh, punitive action on the basis of violations of uh, of the MCC like how it banned Amit Shah Mr Amit Shah who's the present uh, home minister of our country and Azam Khan from campaigning in uh, during the 2014 uh, general election campaigns so uh, 
it is also very important that uh, making baseless claims against a political party which cannot be proven is also a violation under the model code of conduct because recently during the campaigning for the uh, for the madhya pradesh state elections uh, priyanka gandhi mrs priyanka gandhi had gone on to say that uh, uh, the bhel the the the, the, the state run electricity psu if i'm not wrong was uh, given away to big industrialists like amani and adani and only the prime minister was to be blamed for that so she was sent a censure notice by the election commission of india stating that these were baseless claims and she was violating the violating the the, the, the mcc yeah i so, mean uh, largely though uh, largely though mm-hmm. the lack of enforceability of the model code of conduct is also a win for a lot of political parties without taking names though because yeah. after a point you really cannot stop anybody from making baseless allegations and uh, i think a, lo- a large number of uh, interpretations or misinterpretations of government policy might be uh, might be viewed in the public domain or interpreted a certain way by a certain political party and a lot of this starts much before a state assembly goes to polls or the lok sabha elections so yeah a i think that by the time the model code of conduct sets in a lo- large amount of disinformation and misinformation has in some ways already happened yes and, absolutely uh, and i don't think that there's any way to in uh, any way to prevent that from happening till uh political parties themselves come in a kind of self regulatory role where a kind of consensus approach is followed that they say that okay we will only criticize your policy we will criticize your implementation now even uh, mobilizing political parties against castes or religious groups or communities it should be in some ways a practice that should be followed throughout the election cycle now But 20- it is not followed at all like yeah. there are certain political parties which are which have been stratified representing certain caste groups and uh, if those political parties do not have the backing of those particular caste groups they would cease to exist so the 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 goal of ensuring that uh, no caste based stratification happens with respect to politics is uh, is a goal that has failed with respect to the moral code of conduct because even though there are there are no no general calls for uh, for certain uh, uh, for certain caste groups to come and vote for uh, the, their respective political parties but it is always understood through subtle imagery and uh, campaigning where it is known that if you vote for this political party that political party will Uh, work for your benefit and for your uh, gain all alone yeah. so that angle of the mcc has uh, fallen uh, fallen to deaf ears in my opinion in fact uh, another aspect of mcc uh, mcc's failure is that uh, 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 another uh, very important rule uh, under the code of conduct is that uh, religious institutions like temples churches cannot be used for political campaigns even though they are not used for political campaigns but we know ourselves that certain religious institutions uh, are used as a way of sending out a message to the uh, broader community at large as to which political party has to be put in power and uh, the religious institutions uh, in states like uttar pradesh and bihar still play a very important role in deciding uh, what political party needs to be Uh, brought to the f- foray of uh, political domination according to what the cleric has to say i mean and also uh, communal tensions do park yeah. up around the time of elections yeah. fairly fairly passionate claims are made statements are made and the enforcement or the will to enforce the model code of conduct in various states the prevention of usage of government machinery for election the prevention of uh, uh, opposition parties making such statements here and there the enforcement of all these things can, 
throughout the year because assembly polls are happening every year in certain states here and there and then eventually the the, the years leading up to the lok sabha election the few months leading up to the lok sabha election those assembly polls are looked at a very keen eye looking at all of this i think uh, i find a lot of merit in the proposals relating to the one nation one election uh, idea very recently the former president of india led panel uh, uh, former president ramnath kovin led panel submitted its report to the incumbent president of india and uh, the report has largely concluded a positive view for uh, uh, conducting of a nation one election so let's speak about that a bit we know that the conducting of lok sabha elections and uh, assembly elections and your local body elections whether a municipality in an urban area or your panchayat in a rural area can be done together and that that is a much for a country which is already fairly centralized like india i find that a much more sustainable approach with respect to usage of state resources now let's also think uh, about it from a perspective that if we are already conducting lok sabha elections in seven phases one nation one election doesn't mean you're doing it in one day right you're just doing it over the same period so you can maybe take a couple of more phases or make more administrative distinctions but uh, the day for example me in gurugram haryana i go to vote for my legislator the same day i go to vote for the mp from gurgaon and then later on maybe at the same polling booth go and cast my vote for the local corporator or ward or whatever so i find a lot of merit in that let's get your thoughts on that jay uh, i i have a differing view towards that uh, specifically because uh, the whole organization would be extremely chaotic of uh, such a multi faceted uh, uh election because uh, then not only are you taking into consideration so many various uh regional parties which do not have much of a uh, national merit and then they would have to you know uh, change their outlook and approach in su- such a way that they have to just be prepared for a singular uh, singular election uh, which would lead to uh, Uh, which would lead to monopoly of sorts for, for certain political parties and i feel the democratization uh, which the indian elections are so well known for will be done away with that is my opinion i disagree with you on this and i will tell okay. you my disagreement also in a very interesting way yeah how much has your political ideology changed jay since october 2023 Mm, my political ideology hasn't changed much since October 2023. So you would hypothetically mm-hmm. be voting along similar lines, right? Yes, yes. So we can assume every rational actor who holds a voter identity card in India is yeah. uh, is not really radically changing their ideology over. I time. I agree with what you're saying, but to counter that, what I can no, say no, 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 is no. that let, let, yeah. let me finish. Yeah, yeah. What I'm trying to say is that. Uh, in december 2018 madhya mm-hmm. pradesh chatisgarh rajasthan all three of them went to polls mm-hmm. and all three states the assembly election was won by the congress party and 6 months later or 5 months later those mm-hmm. very states with the same voters the same mm-hmm. 18 plus demographic voted in uh, the incumbent ruling party the bharatiya janata party overwhelmingly Yeah, that's exactly so, what I was gonna say. No, so the, you're proving my point further that uh, the, the average voter has the consciousness of deciding whether to vote on uh, your local regional affairs and to vote on your uh, parliament okay. parliamentary affairs separately. So okay. the legislative assembly elections were won by the Congress okay. party, and in the same state, same states, mm-hmm. the the Lok Sabha elections were won by BJP. to add to this odisha has a very long standing regional party as its ruling party and uh, odisha's elections also happen right after the lok sabha elections uh, right around the lok sabha elections so give me 
and uh, they overwhelmingly vote for their regional party in their state assembly and uh, vote for uh, uh, a different party in Lok Sabha. So this uh, this centralization anxiety has been expressed before. I don't okay. blame you for having it, but uh, yeah. there is very interesting hypotheses that can speak uh, 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 or provide a contrary contrary view. Okay, fair enough. It is definitely an experiment that has that time has come. Uh, the first uh, few Lok Sabha elections and assembly elections happened together mm -hmm. only. Later on, the political instabilities of the 60s and 70s led to many governments being suspended in the middle. Some state governments being uh, being totally relinquished from power. And then their elections would be held in random years. As a result, the election cycle changed. Even now, by one nation, one election, because I'm saying it can be done in phases, Lok Sabha election is happening in 2024. Few months back, we've already seen Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Mizoram go to polls. Now, later, we will see Haryana go to polls. We will see Andhra Pradesh go to polls. We will see Odisha yeah. going to polls. So the Lok Sabha elections and 12, 13 states elections are already happening within this one year. So if you okay. can just push these elections closer to the Lok Sabha, pull back some elections from maybe October to like June, July, make the phases longer, the one nation, one election exercise can actually be conducted. That is my view. Okay. Nee, that is a pretty convincing argument. And uh, I can certainly reconsider my fears with regards to centralization. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad uh, that uh, <laughs> I could... <laughs> It's the civil, the civil discussion. You hardly yeah. see guys talking over political ideologies and concede. But uh, yeah, bada bhai, bada bhai hota hai for a reason. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, Wait, I are, you, are you calling yourself the elder brother? No, no, I'm calling you. Yeah. I'm calling you the elder brother for having the greatness to okay. concede. No, actually, uh, my whole uh, doubt with respect to centralization was that whether the regional parties. Uh, whether the regional parties would be able to accommodate themselves in this new uh, new political climate that would be presented to them. That was my main uh, anxiety and I think you have uh, summed it up pretty well. So uh, we can leave that to rest. Uh, do yes. you want to talk about criminalization of politics and how that has affected the elections? Yes, I I think that this is a very, very tight rope because uh, yes. to many, to a large extent, criminalization of politics was and has been so rampant that uh, its reversal is going to be a long process. Absolutely. So you have was... provisions of the Representation of People's Act and uh, you have uh, guidelines of the Election Commission that do their best to... Uh, prevent criminalization of politics, but the challenges are very complex. It was the Vora committee in 1983, which said that there is a extensive nexus between, uh, uh, between criminals and politicians and eventually people who were in, involved in organized crime and unorganized crime became the people who were the lawmakers. So the law breakers became the lawmakers and that was highlighted in Vora committee. And according to which there were certain changes that were uh, recommended to the Section 8 of the rec uh, of the Representation of People's Act 1951. Section 8 deals with the disqualification and deals with the, the crim criminalization of politics aspect that we just discussed. So the Section 8 provides for disqualification and conviction for certain offenses according to which individual punished with a jail term of more than two years cannot stand in elections for six years after the jail term has ended. A lot of people say that the uh, the extension of six years should be made uh, in, in the recommendations. The extension of six years should be made the day the conviction takes place. Some people also say that it should not be for a jail term for two years. It should also be for a jail term for six months. So say if a politician, uh, if, a, if a candidate is, con uh, is convicted, even for a six month jail term, his disqualification and uh, non-participation in election should be 
with the immediate effect uh, on the date of the conviction and and uh, and not once the jail term ends so these are the recommendations that are made which haven't been implemented as of now and uh, and it is said that uh, the uh, people with a criminal record uh, in in uh, in in our legislation has only increased uh, in in the recent history yeah fair i mean yeah. see i will not blame any particular authority for prevention of uh, criminalization of politics or for rather the inefficiency inefficiencies in its prevention because uh, it is a question about the social fabric of our country and mm-hmm. i feel like this is an issue that is deeply interlinked first with electoral funding yeah. because to generate large sums of money to be able to contest an election you need access to many land resources many kind of other resources the generation of large amounts of income uh, for example you have a uh, you have a candidate who has a criminal background he has an assistant who he can promise that i will help assist you in your political career that person has a certain amounts of encroached land which he can sell off for these things you need uh, uh, for these things you need uh, muscle power you need uh, you need a certain kind of dabdaba uh, as they say in rural areas you know yeah. you need you need muscle power essentially to be able to generate that kind of money so large sums of money need to be generated for conduction of elections because we need to conduct a campaign after all and uh, i feel like if we look for appropriate funding channels and establishment of more transparency in the funding process the degree of criminalization might r- reduce it will not totally go away because it might expose you to white collar criminals some kind of financial crimes people will try to outdo that process legally find loopholes there also but that the- ha the murder is the land encroachment and the muscle power element of politics might reduce a little bit and for that reason uh, you can't speak of electoral funding without speaking of the electoral bonds for uh, <laughs> for reasons uh, which may be well argued and agitated in the supreme court not my area to comment on or much beyond my understanding also but i found merit in that idea i found merit in the idea of electoral bonds largely because it at least gave a supervisory authority to the funds that came in and uh, and i feel it also increased the levels of uh, transparency the moment the supreme court said that the data needs to be released as as to how much a political party has gained through the funding under electoral bonds uh, the state bank of india released the information immediately so again the argument that india is becoming a, a non transparent state is uh, contradictory to the recent uh, approach that has been taken by the central central state bank of india mm-hmm. with, respect a... funding, uh, with respect to funding with respect to funding the and uh, elections uh, that brings us directly to the indrajit gupta committee on state funding of elections Indrajit Gupta committee talked about maintenance of accounts by political parties uh, and their audits uh, it basically sought to ban on donations by big companies and corporations to political uh, parties and it also uh, prohibited the inclusion of expenses of political parties uh, in the uh, election expenses of various candidates these were the recommendations that were put forward by the indrajit gupta committee it also sought to empower the election commission of india to fix a ceiling on the election expenses before the general elections so this is the history of how state funding was put forward in uh, you know in uh, in the electoral reforms of our country and how it was eventually used with the passage of electoral bonds and other other procedural requirements Uh, later yeah. on i mean there are other ways that have been proposed only last mm-hmm. last week i think uh, the former chief election commissioner sy kureshi wrote a center spread in the indian express where he proposed a, a, an idea that he had already put in the public domain many times before that you have uh, a popularity based uh, state funding of elections of sorts 
so if uh, you have uh, uh, if you have uh, every uh, political party receiving rupees 100 for every vote that is cast that political party can have a few thousand crores per uh, constituency or some kind of figure was calculated forgive me i don't remember the details of that figure i will try to link that article however in the uh, description for those interested they may watch it but i mean again that's another way of proposing election funding in india people might find demerits with that also and uh, many existing systems of electoral funding have demerits i find that it's going to be a policy making challenge to have a perfect system of electoral funding in india which is not marred with controversy but and, uh, having said that it's always wise to uh, engage in these discussions i found the idea proposed by mr qureshi fairly interesting that is why mm -hmm. i still remembered it so mm -hmm. uh, having said that and uh, the, this is an interesting conversation that will keep going on the yes, indian absolutely. election is a the indian election is an exercise which is not easy to conduct it is not perfect it is marred still by a lot of inefficiency related issues but it is uh, admirable it is very admirable the the sheer scale of resources management persons that go into it it's it's it's, uh, it's quite admirable yeah. like uh, going to the most remote corners of arunachal pradesh and uh, that's in the northeast and then going to the most remote corners of the run of kutch for the election process to take place it's it's a massive massive process and the amount of people that is being covered the data set that is required the information that is being gathered the allocation of resources it is a gargantuan task and uh, the braggadocio around india being the biggest democracy makes sense once you actually understand the scale of things and the amount of different ethnic groups religious identities and regional identities that are covered in the in the process and it somehow breaks the unitary idea of india and makes us realize that we are much more than the perceived western standards for us <laughs> to conclude the conversation i agree <laughs> So I suppose we can yeah. conclude today's conversation. Yes. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Like, subscribe, yeah. share. You guys know. Please, the please point. like, subscribe, share. देखाओ भाई सबको देखाओ. अच्छी बातें कर रहे हैं. सही में. तो कह नहीं रहा यार. कर दो यार सब्सक्राइब प्लीज प्लीज. आल तू फाल तू आल तू फाल तू की रील दिखा सकते हो यार तो ये भी दिखा दो क्या पता थोड़ा ज्ञान मिल जाए किसी को या हमें ज्ञान मिल जाए. हम थोड़ी कह रहे हैं कि हमें सब पता है वेयर इज आवर डिस्कशन या मैन इफ यू आर रॉन्ग टू जस्ट टेल अस दैट वी आर रॉन्ग इन द कमेंट्स एंड इफ यू आर नॉट देन दैट्स गुड ऑन अस बिकॉज़ देन यू हैव डन अ डिलिजेंट रिसर्च ओके ऑन दैट नोट गाइस बाय बाय हैप्पी होली हैप्पी होली बाय गाइस लव यू मम मम